Double apologies, I'm afraid. Firstly, because I'm clearly not Becky Jones. Also, because I'm more Romanesque than Roman Frontier. So this is, a, this is going to be me reading her, her talk without too much prior knowledge. I'm a curator. I'm Deputy Head of Archaeology at Historic Environment Scotland. So I look at these, uh, these sites very much with a curator's eye. OK. Right. So Roman Scotland lies very much on the periphery of the Roman Empire. From the latter part of the first century, it was very much in the frontier zone, and the Antonine War was Rome's northwest frontier for a generation into the mid uh, second century. The dominant aspect of Roman Scotland has been a focus on the military, with Romanization <coughs> not gaining the dominance outlined in the session's abstract in the way it did further south. It's fair to say that over the generations, much of our historical narrative has been supplied by classical authors, with archaeology serving only to flesh, add flesh to the bones of history, rather than contradict or to challenge it. Debate tended to focus on specific aspects of dating, with archaeology only tin um, tinkering around the edges of the historical narrative. Artifact studies have by and large conformed to this picture. Indeed, some of the historical events shown on this slide, such as the Battle of Mons Grampius, if it ever happened, are only known from historical sources with no corroborating archaeological evidence. Yet it has been the source of numerous papers and books, and is something which I am frequently asked about when giving lectures to local archaeological societies. I even had a BBC documentary maker ring me up for a pitch around a project on this particular, this particular event. Unsurprisingly, it was a TV programme that never actually got made. There is a whole debate around whether the ba battle was fought in AD 83 or AD 84, a level of precision which completely baffles our prehistoric colleagues. <laughs> but we can get precise dating through archaeology on occasion, as shown through the dendrochronological analysis, which has been carried out on the Roman fort at Carlisle. Other dates are tantalisingly referred to in the literature, but so far have proved elusive to archaeology, such as the campaigns by Marcellus in the, in the uh, 180s and in the 4th century campaigns against the Picts. This dominance is partly down to the survival of the biography of the governor Agricola by his son-in-law Tacitus. This is hagiography, but from the 18th century until the latter part of the 20th century, archaeologists sought to fit their finds to this narrative as presented in his biography. There are numerous other literary sources alongside sculpture, inscriptions, coinage, etc., but this one is very much dominated. In the late 1980s, Bill Hansen sought to challenge this literary dominance through his critical review of the archaeological evidence for the period, Agricola and the Conquest of the North, shown here. And more recently, Birgitta Hoffman has produced her own study of, arche of archaeology versus history. The tales from archaeology are starting to be heard, and there is beginning to be a shift in the theoretical narrative. Roman archaeology in Scotland has a long pedigree, and some would argue that it has dominated archaeological discourse in Scotland relative to its chronological time frame. It has suffered from the danger of being plundered unquestioningly by Iron Age historians and archaeologists utilising synthesis to support some hypotheses and uh, contemporary settlement dating. This dominance began with the antiquarians looking at history books, but they built upon a legacy they built upon a legacy for modern Scottish archaeology. William Roy provided the first accurate <coughs> maps of Roman Scotland in the 18th century and is the fa founding father of modern mapping through the Ordnance Survey. He was first inspired by General Robert Melville and went upon horseback looking for Roman sites, particularly Mons Graupius, with a copy of Agricola's Tacitus. Uh, Tacitus is Agricola's. <laughs> this is what happens when you stick a medievalist in front of him <laughs> <laughs> in his pocket. <laughs> Melville, Melville himself was inspired by a collection of Roman artefacts in Sir John Clerk's house in Pennycook, where in particular he admired what he believed to be a Roman gladius, his military training leading him to imagine that such a weapon could have been employed. It's thought that this particular item was, however, a Bronze Age sword. <coughs> the physician and professor of anatomy, William Hunter's collections in the 18th century, founded the Hunterian Museum in the, in the University of Glasgow. But modern studies really began in the last decade of the 19th century with a campaign of excavations by the Glasgow Archaeological Society and the Society of Antiquaries of Scotland also looking to prove some of the texts 
Glasgow were looking to test their comment on the life of Antonius Pius, or Antoninus Pius, in the history of Augusta, and that the Antonine Wall was built at Turf, which in fact we now know that it was. In the early 20th century, archaeology and archaeological studies of Romans in uh, Scotland were dominated by a few male figures. Sir George MacDonald for the Antonine Wall studies. Some of the theories which he proposed before the Second World War have stood the test of time. OGS Crawford starting look at, to look at aerial survey and looking at the topography of Roman Scotland. St Joseph, without whom aerial survey in, Scotland, in Roman Scotland would be far poorer. But his excavations were sometimes undertaken purely to prove his own theories. Ian Richmond, who could draw up an entire plan of a fort based on a few small trenches. But they were very much men of their time, and I will not criticise them for the techniques which they deployed. But they were not always quit critically evaluated enough by subsequent de generations, with plans reproduced without the necessary health warnings. Some modern techniques, such as detailed aerial, aerial mapping and geophysical survey, are starting to challenge some of these theories, however. The dominance of Ed Brierley of the, um, of the Durham School in Roman military studies has been written about by Professor Simon James. Durham and Glasgow universities have a strong interest, had a strong interest in Roman archaeology, with archaeologists <coughs> working on Roman Scotland in Newcastle and Manchester as well. The Royal Commission on the Ancient Mo and um, Historical Monuments of Scotland had a long tradition of Roman studies in its early years. George MacDonald was chair in the 1930s, and Kenneth Steer, secretary for over 20 years, was a Roman archaeology graduate from Durham. Steer and, and um, Gordon Maxwell drove forward the theoretical uh, framework which has dominated the landscape of Roman Scotland through their research. Indeed, Maxwell was very much one of a quartet of Roman scholars dominate, who dominated Roman archaeology in Scotland in the late 20th century, the three other being David Brees, Bill Hansen and Lawrence Kepi. Professor Annie Robertson, Kepi's effective predecessor at the Hunterian Museum, was a rare 20th century female in Roman Scotland. Textbooks written by these four, together with Kepi's updating of Robertson's handbook, still dominate the narrative, as much of the theoretical Roman Scotland was um, theoretical framework of Roman Scotland was set in the 1970s. But some of these theories established in the 1970s and are starting to be challenged, and I will return to this shortly. So military arche um, archaeological investigation has been very much the poor relation to civilian studies when it comes to the interests of theoretical theoreticians in uh, the Roman period looking at Scotland, with studies of Roman Scotland being seen as dominated by the sites and artefacts of the army. Iron Age scholars and Roman scholars were seemingly never the twain shall meet, despite some Roman scholars discussing Roman and native with its colonial overtones, and Iron Age specialists utilising Roman evidence from time to time. It is more recently through the work of Fraser Hunter and others, such as uh, Louisa Campbell and James Brunn, and Birgitta Hoffman and David Wollescroft on the Roman Gas Frontier Project, that Iron Age communities and their inter interaction with Rome has started to become a more serious study. Discussions of Roman finds at Iron Age sites featuring, are featuring more and more in the narrative, largely thanks to the work of Fraser Hunter again, whose work on hordes is significantly advancing our understanding of the complex relationships which existed in the first centuries of the first millennium AD. In 2012, the first archaeological research framework for Scotland was published, led by the Society of Antiquaries of Scotland, with funding from Historic Scotland, which is now part of Historic Environment Scotland. <coughs> Initially intended as a subset of the Iron Age panel, the Roman period developed into a panel report in its own, in its own right, and the entire framework is hosted online, enabling it for be to be updated with new knowledge as new theories develop. This has allowed the sector to articulate what we knew about Roman Scotland, discuss the theoretical framework, and propose new areas for future research. As you can see from this paragraph, we highlighted just why it's an exciting time to study Roman Scotland. Military history and politics have been enlivened by studies questioning long-held theories about frontier history. Other topics are now under study, including military supply, the diversity of peoples and identities in the frontier zone, and more subtle understandings of interactions with the indigenous population there. The Roman period presents a wealth of complex data with which to explore these topics, so that the application of these ideas and the questioning of former certainties can be newly revived for Roman Scotland. 
and we articulated key research areas as seen here, where Scotland contributes to the wider Roman frontier studies and the development of theories around Roman frontiers, theoretical perspectives around identity, interactions and frontier life, the military dispositions and chronology, and the traditional bread and butter of, um, of um, Roman frontier studies. Landscape context, and we will hear more about this from Andrew Tibbs later on, and the legacy of Rome after Rome. I would encourage anybody with an interest to please go and look at the SCARF website. And I would add to what, to what Becky said, we are actually developing a network of regional research frameworks across Scotland now, which will significantly enhance our national research framework, but that's very much under development as we speak. So as we we're in Chester, I could not resist but throw in an aside as to the curious elliptical building. It has been speculated that Chester was intended to be the capital of Britannia once conquest was complete, which never happened. Therefore, giving Chester an added significance when researching Roman conquests of Scotland. Both the National Museum of Scotland in Edinburgh and the Hunterian Museum at the University of Glasgow have important collections for the study of Roman Scotland, together with a host of local museums. Researchers range from the dating of pottery to theories around interaction between, military, between Roman military and Iron Age communities. Our increasing understanding of the, the diversity of military and Iron Age communities themselves and Roman silver is used as bullion. The list goes on and it's fair to say that there is scope for an awful lot of research to be done on this fantastic surviving material. This brings me on to one of the most, well, to the most significant Roman monument in Scotland, the Antonine Wall, a successor to Hadrian's Wall in the mid second century AD, but only for around 20 years. 10 years ago, it was inscribed as a World Heritage Site as part of the international frontiers of the, Ro of the Roman Empire World Heritage Site. This has stimulated a bit more research on the monument, but there's still plenty more to do. And connected to that, I just wanted to mention that Scotland has six World Heritage Sites. This means that it is frequently seen as the creme de la creme, well, the Antonine Wall is seen as one of the creme de la creme of Scottish sites, with a lot of interest from politicians, among others. Whilst not always seen as relevant, as, uh, relevant to those working in the public sector, having a political interest and support is incredibly important to us when looking after a monument such as this, when we try to, and when we try to demonstrate the value of what we do. So moving on to developer-led excavations, in terms of ongoing research, like elsewhere, there is new research coming up from developer-led excavations, whether on known sites telling us much more about their occupation, origins and society, functions and dating. But as everybody will know, whilst this research comes to completion <coughs> with the publication and archiving of results, the excavators themselves may have had no prior background in Roman military archaeology or its theory and therefore focus, uh, focus on presenting only the results, rather than looking to see where it fits in with the wider picture. What these results mean for our wider understanding and the general synthesis is left to other individuals with time and energy to undertake this research, including the application of new theoretical models. Echoing scarf, it is an exciting time, but only for the people who have the time to do the exciting research. A recent excavation in the course of a new road development around Aberdeen uncovered a host of Roman ovens and possibly a Roman camp, but with no surrounding ditch. Another recent excavation in Eyre also found a group of Roman ovens, again, probably representing a marching camp. In both instances, the fact that the site was probably associated with the Roman military was not realized until the radiocarbon dates came back. In the case of Aberdeen, shown on this slide, they were on the site they were still on site and could probably have considered the excavation strategies in light of this. The radiocarbon dates indicate that the ovens were fired in the Flavian period in the first century AD. However, a popular publication of these results with a press release on the findings has suggested that the level of precision of the dating was not possible with some of the dates. Again, they have taken the historical narrative and the press release included statements such as this. Roman activity, likely dates 83 to 84 AD, possibly constructed by the Roman army at the time of invasion led by the general Agricola. Therefore, continuing the ongoing narrative attributing everything in the Flavian Scotland to the work of Agricola. 
Despite the work of Roman archaeologists to move the debate on, Tacitus' biography of Agricola still casts a long shadow. Other recent publications and sites which are about to be published include legacy projects, those where excavations are several decades old, but the site has finally been written up, often due to impending or recent retirement of an excavator, which means that the time is now available to do this. Whilst it is frustrating that we have to wait such a long time for the results, the excavations, excavators have taken on board more recent research, new theoretical models, and questioned the presentation of material. Here is some of the material from the recently published excavations at Bear's Den on the Antonine Wall. The excavations themselves were undertaken in the 1970s to the early 1980s. The delay in publication meant that the placing of the headquarters building could be significantly re-evaluated. The environmental evidence is, has been particularly significant in aiding our understanding of diet and supply, and research on the pottery enabled new theories to be proposed regarding the possible ethnicity and mobility of the soldiers based there and elsewhere on the wall. Vivian Swan's research on the courseware pottery was suggestive of a North African presence. This has been much debated over the last 20 years, but the recent discovery of a Roman diploma has connected one of the regiments stationed on the wall with the war, with the war in Mauritania. So we now do have tangible North, North, North African connection, and the subject is ripe for future research. Other research projects include the long-running Gas Bridge project led by David, David Wallacecroft and Brigitte Hoffman. This has been associated with the University of Manchester in Liverpool and is now a significant independent research project. This is a long-term research project to study the Iron Age and Roman sites along the Gas Bridge and beyond, regularly producing publications and online reports. Historic Environment Scotland and Canterbury University recently par partnered up to supervise a PhD by Nick Hannon on the Lid LIDAR survey connected for the Antonine Wall, again a benefit of its World Heritage Site status, and to produce interpretive analysis. Some papers have already been published shedding interesting light on the metrics of this frontier. Historic Environment Scotland has recently funded a postdoctoral post work by Dr Louise Campbell of the University of Glasgow looking at traces of pigmentation on the collection of distant stones from the Antonine Wall. Campbell applied portable um, X-ray fluorescence and Raman spectrometry to try and detect pigmentation. A lot of previous research on these stones focused on what the metrics of the stones could tell us about the building of the Antonine Wall and on the iconography of the stones themselves, as seen here in the most famous example the Bridgeness Slab at the, east end of the, at the east end of the wall and now in the National Museum in Edinburgh. This was the first time that this sort of scientific analysis had been applied to these stones. Dr Campbell's research produced a palette of colours, almost 50 shades of red, which indicate just how, how brightly these stones were painted in antiquity. One of the most striking discoveries was the bright red around the neck of a decapitated captive, which showed it to be quite a gory scene. Another interesting current project is that which has been carried out by the Tremontian Trust at Burns Walk in Dumfries and Galloway, a short distance northwest from Hadrian's Wall. Since the 1960s, the site had been considered to be a, the site of a practice siege, a training ground for the Roman army, a theory put forward by Kenneth Steer and widely adopted. Steer himself had an army intelligence background, having been one of the monuments men. In the 1990s, two PhDs challenged the notion that this was a practice site, but some theories have taken root, like the notion of everything in the first century falling to Agricola, and these are dogmatically believed and have become fact. A recent metal detecting survey and excavation work has challenged this again, but there is still a raging debate as to how we prove something took place during a war or during training. Research has also provided detailed dating and whether we see this as real or a, pra or a practice siege we now know that it took place early in the Antonine reconquest of Scotland, and this is at least one, one site which cannot be attributed to Agricola. My own research has focused on military camps, trying to critically reevaluate the work of St Joseph and others, and consider both facts and factoids which have grown up around these sites. 
Matt Simmons' research focus on, focuses on fortlets, and he has been putting forward some interesting theories as to why fortlets were used and whether they were <coughs> military dispositions for the army. Another recent area of debate has centered on the planning and building of the Antonine Wall. Were all the sites planned from the start, but perhaps built in a different sequence? Or was there a genu genuine change of design? This has been a recent challenge to a theory put forward in the 1970s and accepted for at least the past 40 years, and the debate rages on. All of this research has application by those involved in policy making and implementation of government regulations, whether Scottish, UK or European. In the case of my research, it has been used in a project re um, undertaking the rescheduling of larger Roman monuments in Scotland. All the Antonine Wall research work has multiple applications, thanks to the range of projects now being undertaken through its World Heritage designation. Here we have some examples where we are using recent and new research to provide accessible interpretation through mobile applications, known as the Advanced Limes application. And together with partners in Germany and Austria, we have received funding from the Euro European Union's Creative Europe programme to develop and deliver this project. We have also used research to create educational materials aimed at engaging school children with the Antonine Wall and the Romans in Scotland. This has included the creation of a new game called Go Roman, which is also based on research. And archaeo gaming is a whole new area in its own right. As mentioned earlier, the Antonine Wall is part of the frontiers of the Roman Empire World Heritage Site, and we have a pan-European collaboration clustering together to expand four World Heritage Sites to, to make sure that they work better together. We currently have 10 countries in Europe working together, but we also have a longer term goal of working with colleagues in the Near East and North Africa, alongside management work that needs to, be, needs to take place to enable this vision to happen. Everything is underpinned by research, and the beauty of Roman frontiers is that they cannot be studied in isolation and we need to collaborate in order to push knowledge forward. This is done in multiple ways, but the Limes community gets together every three years for an international congress on Roman frontier studies, known as the Limes Congress. Next meeting in Nimegen, I think that's how you pronounce that word. Nimegen, okay, never been to the Netherlands. In 2021, if anybody wants to join us for the congress, she says this is a shameless plug. I'm assuming everybody in the room is invited. <laughs> and this is what a cluster model looks like if anyone's interested. I'm sure there are management theories out, out there which are bound, but I won't go there. And the last area to mention is the local community interest and involvement that we have in what we do around these frontiers. This is the replica of the Bridgeness distant, Distance Lab on display in Bowness. <coughs> Thanks to a new project called Rediscovering the Antonine Wall with funding from HLF and others, we are creating five more of these with an option to, and the option is open to local communities to have a full colour replica based on Louisa Campbell's research. My favourite aspect of this project will be the creation of five Roman play parks, which is now, the designing of which is now well underway. So I hope that you will agree with me that this is an exciting time to study Roman Scotland. So why have I entitled my lecture with a Roman Scotland? Most of the researchers that I have named today are in their 40s or older, and a large number are now retired. Most of us working still do, acts, do so out with academia. There are a few of us at Historic Environment Scotland, including myself, James Brunn, Fraser Hunter at the National Museum, Matt Simmons, Simmons at Current Archaeology, Louisa Campbell's permanent job is in administration at the Physics Department of the University of Glasgow. David Wollescroft and Brigitte Hoffman's Gas Ridge project is independent. There are no longer any specialists in Roman Scotland working in academia or elsewhere. Professor Bill Hansen has retired from Glasgow in 2015 and after an abortive attempt at a sort of replacement, his post was axed. Edinburgh University undertakes Roman research but the focus is elsewhere, such as Italy, not Scotland. And other universities in Scotland don't have much engagement with Roman archaeology. Looking to the north of England, both Newcastle and Durham have major research strength in, strengths in Roman frontier um, studies. But in both cases, they have this as their major monument, Hadrian's Wall, 
on their doorstep. And while some research happens to include Scotland, such as Andrew Tibbs' research, which we will hear more about today, this is not the major focus for his supervising academics. So do I need to be so parochial when discussing this? But in the shift in funding for undergraduates, the shift in funding for undergraduate degrees means that the Scottish student doesn't pay fees to study in Scotland, whereas they do in England. So most, so most go to Scottish universities, and a Scottish student in a Scottish university gets limited limited information as to things currently stand about Roman Scotland. So who is going to stimulate the next generation? How do we ensure that those undertaking developer-funded research have sufficient knowledge about the sites they are excavated when they have barely been exposed to it? This is why Agricola is now being mentioned in the context of anything in the first century, despite the fact that many of us have been trying, clearly unsuccessfully, to demonstrate the archaeological picture in Scotland is far more complex. So I return to the question in my abstract. How can we nurture the talent of the next generation? And it probably remains to me to thank various colleagues, including Kirsty Owen, who probably wants to do this after reading my paper. Thank you very much.